Well, hi again, this is Bob, and I'm over on page uh, 344, and we're getting ready to discuss one of the more interesting um, properties or theorems that we have <coughs> uh, when we're dealing with inferential statistics. Uh, remember, at the beginning of the class, in chapter 1 or chapter 2, they told us that uh, statistics broke down into two um, uh, main categories, if you will, and one of them was descriptive and the other one was inferential. And uh, this is a pretty straightforward uh, theorem to use. It's just a formula, and it's a formula that we've just been um, added something to. We've seen it before. But before we uh, get into the um, uh, lesson here, and I'm hoping that my pen and my uh, connection hold, uh, because this is the third time I've tried this particular lesson here. But I'd like you to just go back for a second and take a look at example uh, 6-7 uh, on page 330. It's nice to know um, uh, the use of this. And the reason I went back to this question here, and there was a homework question like it, but what we're doing, it dealt with a... Um, uh, uh, um, the average American household and how much garbage or pounds of newspaper uh, for garbage or recycling that they generate per month. And what we did, and we had our, our uh, new formula or recent formula, is we used this formula because the important thing to notice uh, up to now, and this is just on 6.2, so we're just moving, uh, we're moving a step back before we go a step forward, but the question was asked in terms of one household. Okay, and we were basically supposed to find out the probability using our uh, normal distribution tables, of course, that a particular household chosen at random would generate between 27 and 31 pounds of newspaper slash garbage per month. And then the second part of that question, which I worked both of them out, uh, would be one household uh, generated more than 30.2 pounds of newspaper slash garbage per month. Okay, well, the operative word in that uh, question there is one household. And, of course, for one household, we would find the z value. They gave us the random variable uh, uh, x, and we've got a mean, and we've got a standard deviation. And, of course, what we did was we found the um, uh, z value for those questions, and we converted it into uh, an area, and then we used the area to give us a percent or probability. Okay, well, now where we're going with this is what happens if the n, the number of households, used, again referring to this sample question, was greater than 1? Maybe like 10 or 15 or 20 or 50 or 100 or something like that. Well, that would involve another formula. And over the years that I've taught this class, I've, I've presented this material a uh, number of ways. And I found the way that works best uh, is just to describe the situation as best I can, give the new formulas, ask you, as always, to do a close reading, and then work some example problems. Okay, and the way they start off, now I'm back over on three, 344, finally, but the way they start off is they give us a little situation uh, where um, we take 30 adult males and we pull them out of a large sample, and we measure their uh, triglycer triglyceride levels. But we don't stop there. We, those 30 males go back into the large population, and then we pull out another sample size of 30 males, record that triglyceride level, and we continue to pull out samples of 30 males over and over and over again, in fact, until we have 100 samples. Okay, and by the way, each time we take out a sample of 30 males, uh, don't forget that we compute that average triglyceride level. Well, this is what we end up with here is a, and I'll read it here so I can use their language, 
uh, it says what we end up with, uh, the mean, these, it, what happens then is the mean that we continually find becomes a random variable, and the different sample means constitute a sampling distribution of sample means. So normally, well, I'll just hold off on the theory part before, but what we have is instead of a distribution of, um, of variables uh, from a data set, Xs, is now we have a distribution of uh, sample means. And I'm just going to tell you right now uh, what happens with this distribution of sample means, um, and then I'll come back and try to tie in some other information here. But two things are really important. The first thing is that the distribution of the uh, sample means, it turns out that the mean of the sample means will be the exact same as the population mean. And this is what all the math and examples over on page 345 is showing. Okay, they took out samples of every possible combination of samples of two, and then they went ahead and made a uh, frequency distribution, then they went ahead and made a histogram, and then they showed mathematically that the mean of the sample means equaled the population mean. You're welcome to follow that uh, example if you like, or that discussion. Okay, here's the other thing. This is called the central limit theorem, by the way. But the other um, uh, property when we're talking about distribution of sample means is that the standard deviation of the sample means will equal the previous or um, regular standard deviation divided by the root of the sample. In our first example, we took out 30 males at a time, but we might sample 20 kids or 25 construction workers or whatever. And it turns out that our um, uh, standard deviation is reduced exactly by the uh, square root of the number of samples we pulled out for each of our uh, sample means. And all of this is carefully gone through and shown with the book's example. Uh, over on page uh, bottom of uh, 344 all the way over to uh, the top of page 346. Okay, so th that's the idea of this. The mean of the sample means uh, is the same as the original population mean, and our sample standard deviation, or excuse me, uh, our uh, original standard deviation when we're dealing with sample means is reduced by the uh, square root of the size of the samples. Now, since the means of the population mean uh, are uh, normally distributed, they ter it turns out that we can use our uh, normal distribution to make calculations. And if you notice over on page uh, 347, I'm not doing the presentation exactly like the book is, but I'm covering the same material. Here's our normal bell curve. This would be uh, for our normally dis distributed um, data, okay, like we've seen in so many questions. And if you notice what they, uh, the shape, it seems like that bell has been pushed or squeezed in on both sides. It looks something like this now. But first of all, I want to mention that the area under both curves is still equal to 1, or 1.00 as a, um, uh, or 100 percent. So the area under the curves is the same. And if you're asking yourself, well, how come the, our, uh, um, our curve on the top of 347 seems to be pushed or puckered in, it's because the standard deviations um, are smaller, okay? It squeezes the, 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 our denominator. Let's go look at our formula again real quick. I'll show you our new formula uh, shortly. Okay, this is our previous formula uh, where we had the standard deviation in our denominator. And now we're taking that standard deviation and we're dividing it by the root of our sample size. And that's going to give us a smaller denominator. Uh, and when we divide the smaller denominator into the uh, um, 
numerator, it has the effect of pushing in the uh, bell curve. We get another curve, which we can still use, but its shape is different. Okay, so some, a couple of other points I wanted to make here. Um, okay, I wanted to, now that we've got a little bit of background, I want, I'm back on page 344, and here's some important things. Uh, and this is, I'm just going to read these out of the text, so I use their language. A sampling distribution of sample means is a distribution using the means computed from all possible random samples of a specific size taken from a population. We just saw that by taking 30 adult males out and measuring their triglyceride levels. Okay, and then it tells us that there could be a sampling, the, there's a sampling error due to the difference between the sample measures and the corresponding population measure due to the fact that the sample is not a perfect representation of the population. But recall that we just don't take one sample, we take many successive samples. Okay, and then finally they tell us when all possible samples of a specific size are selected with replacement from a population, the distribution of the sample means for a variable has two important properties, and we've discussed those. The mean of the sample means is the same as the population mean, and the standard deviation um, gets divided by the root of the sample. Okay, so before we go work a couple of questions here, and they, this what I've just described is a central limit theorem uh, in the middle of page 346. Let's go look at our old formula and our new formula. Here's our previous formula when we're taking one variable from a data set and computing a z value. This would be like the uh, household uh, and their newspaper or garbage, where I started off this lesson. Now, notice that we've got a new formula here. It says, instead of an individual or random variable, like uh, what we were discussing just now, we have a sample mean, and from the sample mean we're subtracting the population mean, and we're dividing that not by the standard deviation, but by the standard deviation divided by the root of our sample size. Now, if our sample size is 1, then we have the exact same formula pretty much as before. But don't forget there's two new things different here. We have a sample mean instead of an individual random variable chosen from the data set or uh, whatever number that we're looking interested in. And then we have uh, the root of the sample size on the bottom. Okay, so um, again, there's some reading for you to do on this. It turns out the questions are um, set up and, and are pretty straightforward from things that we already know. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll read two more things here uh, just from the bottom of the page. And this is uh, number one and two at the bottom of 346. When the original variable is normally distributed, uh, the distribution of sample means will be normally distributed for any sample size n. Okay, that's another way of saying that we can use our normal distribution tables uh, for these questions. And when the distribution of the original variable is not normal, a sample size of 30 or more is needed uh, to use a normal distribution to approximate the distribution of the sample means. And the larger the sample, the better. Okay, now, so here's one thing that you have to, uh, um, that I'll point out now that we'll have to be aware of as we um, work through the next chapters. Look for, uh, on these questions, they should tell us whether the variable is normally distributed, and if not, we should have a sample size of 30 or greater. 
okay, in order for us to use the formula. And of course, on these questions, uh, the majority of them, if not all of them, will deal with a sample, uh, the, uh, um, a uh, distribution that's normal, or the situation can use the normal distribution, or we'll have a sample size 30 or larger. Okay, so let's take a look at this uh, first question here. Uh, this is uh, example uh, 613. I'm only going to do a couple of these because I believe you'll get the idea right away. Uh, we've got a report that says that uh, children uh, between the ages of 2 and 5 watching, uh, watch an average of 25 TV hours per week. Uh, here's our key here. Assume the variable is normally distributed and the standard deviation is 3 hours. Well, when I run into information, I like to write it down. So the mean is 25. And our standard deviation is 3. OK, now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to select 20 kids at random, not one child uh, at random, but 20 kids at random. And we want to find out the probability out of that 20 that we end up with a sample mean. Oops greater than 26.3 hours. So I've got a little data set there. I've got the fact that uh, the mean TV hours is 25 with a standard deviation of 3. Instead of choosing one child at random to find out the probability that that child would watch more than 26.3 hours a week, we are choosing 20 kids. And that means that we have to use um, this formula that deals with the sample mean and that our standard deviation will be reduced uh, by the, uh, or divided by, which makes the denominator smaller, uh, the uh, square root of the sample size. So here's their situation. And I'll try to draw this graph a little more puckered than our normal bell curve. Here's our mean of 25. Let's say that 26.3 is right here. And this is the area that we're interested in. Recall this was the probability that a sample mean will be greater than 26.3 hours. OK. Well, we've done a lot of questions like this before. So we've just got to use our new formula now. And that new formula will tell us that we have 26.3, it's our sample mean, minus the mean, 25, that's our population mean, divided by our standard deviation by of 3, divided by the root of 20. Now, they may have, <coughs> they may have done this question, um, they may have solved uh, uh, 3 divided by root 20 on top. But no matter how we do it, the answer is going to be the same. And they end up with a z value of 1.94. So if you like, let's go look at this. If we convert this to z values, We're back to this situation, even though my bell curve looks more bell than uh, puckered. And we have seen this type of question before. What we do is we find out all the area to the left of 1.94 and subtract it from 1. And when we do that, I'll just go ahead and show how they did it. The area to the left of 1.94 is 0.9738. So this area in question turns out to be 0 0.0262. Therefore, uh, let me write this down here. Uh, the probability of a sample mean greater than 26.3 hours is equal to 2.62%. So <coughs> excuse me. The math is pretty straightforward on that. Uh, but again, the point, uh, let, let's summarize on the top of 348 here. 
one can conclude that the probability of obtaining a sample mean larger than 26.3 hours is 2.62%. Okay, specifically, the probability that 20 kids selected between the ages of 2 and 5 watch more than 26.3 hours of TV per week is 2.62%. So in the past, we could have only found that out for one child, but now we can find it for 20 kids using our new or adjusted formula. And I'm going to ask you to carefully, there's really nothing new on 614. You'll notice that it's the same formula, except it's looking for an area that's bounded between two numbers. I want to close off this and just keep it as straightforward as possible by looking at the bottom of page 348. Because this, along with our new formula and that theory, uh, really makes the important point. It says, uh, students sometimes have a difficulty deciding whether to use this formula, our new one, or our previous formula. Okay, and then they tell us uh, that we use the first formula when we're talking about a um, sample mean, as shown in this section, like a sample of 20 kids watching TV. And then they tell us that we use the second formula uh, when we're talking about an individual data value. And just to make sure that we're uh, understanding this, we're going to work example 615 because it deals with a sample of one and then a sample of greater than one. And then we can also get something uh, when we're done, and we can compare the answers. So let's close off by looking at example uh, 615 on page 349. OK, and it says the average time spent uh, by construction workers who work the weekends is 7.93 hours. That's over two days, uh, with a standard deviation. Uh, oh, and again, assume the distribution is approximately normal. That means we can use our uh, normal distribution, our Z tables. And then it says, um, uh, where does it say? Oh, the standard deviation is 0.8 hours. OK. So we've got two things to do here. And notice that the first one, A, talks about an individual, and B um, talks about a sample of 40 construction workers. So I'm going to put 1 there for individual, or N equals 1 if you like, and then N equals 40. Uh, that's obviously going to be the second formula, or I should say our current formula in uh, 6.3. So let's just set these up, and, and we'll concentrate more on interpreting the answer uh, than the actual answer itself. And the first one is to find the probability that one construction, oh, I'm sorry, um, I didn't give the what we're supposed to be looking for. Uh, Find the probability that an individual who works at that trade works fewer than eight hours on the weekend. Here's our first situation. An individual chosen at random works fewer than eight hours on the weekend. And it was uh, 7.93 was our population mean. Let's say eight is right here. So here's what we're looking for. And remember, our standard deviation was 0.8. OK, so I'm concentrating now on 
the theory rather than the steps that we've worked over pretty darn good over the last uh, several lessons. So this would be uh, 8 minus 7.93 divided by just 0.8. And the book tells us that that turns out to be about 0.09, okay? Uh, so if we were converting that back into um, Z values, we'd be here. And they tell us that the area associated, associated with 0.09 is uh, 0.5359. Or 53.59% were interpreting now the probability that a single construction worker chosen at random works less than eight hours over the, uh, during the weekend would be 53.59%. Remember, that's a single construction worker. Now what we're going to do is we're going to repeat this question, except this time we're going to be uh, having a sample of 40 construction workers. So the formula then, of course, has to be this one, our new formula. Okay, and I'm just going to ask you to uh, look at the drawing here uh, on the top of page uh, 350 so we can concentrate on the mechanics of this question and the interpretation. When they solve the uh, problem, as you can follow there, they end up with Z equaling about 0.55, and they tell us that the area associated with 0.55 is equal to 0 0.7088, or as a probability now that um, our sample mean would be, uh, sorry, less than um, eight hours would be 70.88%. Okay, so we've obviously got a difference there. In fact, uh, on step three, they discussed the difference there. Okay, and it says comparing the two probabilities, the first probability uh, we saw was 53.59%, and the second one for 40 construction workers uh, with a mean of less hours of eight hours per week, less than eight hours per week, was 70.88%. That difference of about 17.3% is due to the fact that the distribution of sample means is much less variable than the distribution of an individual data value. Okay, the greater as the sample size n increases, the standard deviation of the means decrease. And that's just another way of saying that having a larger sample uh, gives us a um, better answer. The larger the sample, um, what they're trying to emphasize there, and I lost my place, uh, the larger the sample, the much less variable um, is the distribution than the individual data values. So what we've been comparing now, they're saying that an individual data value uh, chosen and worked on a question like we just did is more variable than a sample mean. In this case, we had just one, and for our sample mean, we had 40. Okay, anyway, um, as you work the homework questions and as you go back and read over the uh, material in 6.3, I think uh, if there's any gaps there um, that they'll get filled in, especially when we're working the problems and comparing the answers. And when we get around to the test, I'm going to give you a couple of questions like this, and one of them will be for one data value, uh, chosen from a set uh, or individual, if you will, uh, versus um, a sample mean, where we have to use our new formula. And I'll make the question very clear, uh, as the book does in the homework questions.
Okay, well, I'll be back shortly with the um, uh, final lesson in Chapter 6, and it's on the um, uh, another usage of our, uh, by, um, of our normal tables. So I will be back with that shortly. Thank you. Okay.